Portuguese, uh, but I am happy to be here. Uh, thank you very much to Big for inviting me to speak, and thank you to all of you who uh, made it out this early morning after a night that probably involved maybe some samba, maybe some some kevinina. But uh, so this is getting started in transformative VR. And who am I? I am Sean Patton. I am a principal game designer and a VR advocate at a company called Shell Games. We are located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the United States. We, about to have, we have about 115 uh, developers there. We do a lot of client work, a lot of our own IP, and we've been around for about 14 years. Uh, in the VR AR market, we're probably best known for I Expect You to Die, which is a VR spy-themed escape the room game. And I was design director on that, and it's out on all the 6.6 uh, .6 VR platforms. I was also the project director on Water Bears VR, which is a learning game that teaches kids system thinking concepts. Uh, I also worked on Frostbound VR, Lego Brickheads VR, Orion Trail VR, and also some augmented reality titles like Jedi Challenges and Domino World. Now, I Expect You to Die is, is as I said, probably one of our most well-known titles. Uh, it was well received all over the world, in, including here in Brazil, I believe. Uh, now, the video that I'm about to show may have some bad language, so I apologize ahead of time to the translators. Uh, let's take a look at this. Dinheiro. Tem dinheiro, os caras aqui, velho. Você tá maluco? Tem uma brice, tem gás venenoso, tem isso. Flying scorpions. Scorpion? Não, 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 scorpion não! Eu mandei escorpião. J Expect You to Die, sensacional. É um dos jogos que eu mais esperava lançar desde que eu peguei o Oculus Rift DK2, porque é muito legal, é muito divertido ser um agente secreto, assim. Nossa, é sensacional e eu gostei muito. Então eu vou trazer outra, as outras missões com certeza. Não sei se todas, eu não sei quantas são, mas pelo menos um ou dois vídeos eu vou trazer porque eu quero jogar mais. So that was actually one of the first uh, Let's Play videos of I Expect You to Die that uh, had a you know, large uh, view count, sort of a uh, very popular video. Uh, I'm not sure who, how many people know, uh, no, no one here, well, a couple of people, all right, all right. Uh, so when we talk about getting started in transformative VR, I'm going to sort of break this talk down uh, by section. And the first section that I'm going to handle is transformative. What does that mean to me? What would I like to convey to you all about that? Shell games, uh, we create a lot of transformational games, and we define them as games uh, that are developed with the intention of changing players in a specific way that transfers and persists out of the game. So maybe they get new knowledge or new skills, but it stays with them, hopefully, and changes them for the better. Now, if you think about uh, creating game uh, as something difficult, perhaps juggling, and then you think about teaching someone something, it's also pretty difficult. You can think of that as a, you know, riding a unicycle or something like that. And of course, making a transformative game is then like doing both at once, and so it can be very hard. And so at Shell Games, we have, over the years, developed a framework for making this process easier. We call it the transformational framework. Uh, and there are eight main topics or aspects to it. And I'm not going to go into all of them today. Uh, frankly, you could probably write a book about this. And actually, that's exactly what my coworker Sabrina Solva did. Uh, and that book is coming out next month. Uh, so if you're at all interested in this sort of thing, I can highly recommend that book. I'm not biased at all. Um, so, but we are here today and we want to talk about some of these that are most relevant to virtual reality. And so the ones that I'm going to be talking about are the high level purpose, the player transformation that you'd like to see, and the barriers that VR is really good at breaking down when you're trying to teach someone. So when we talk about a high level purpose at Shell Games, it's the big picture goal for the impact on the world that you'd like your game to have. And uh, it, it, you know, that goal could compete with other goals, such as, you know, uh, making money and uh, being popular or critical acclaim, right? And you sort of have to understand, going into a project of this sort, how your high-level purpose fits in with that. Uh, two examples from Shell Games, Water Bears VR, the high-level purpose was provide hands-on experience with systems thinking concepts. And it actually stemmed from a tablet game uh, that was in schools and had a curriculum, but then we also reimagined it for VR. I like to say reimagine because you can't really just port anything to VR. If you try to do that, it's not going to be any good. You really have to design it from the ground up for virtual reality. The other one is Happy Atoms. This is a physical and augmented reality chemistry set. Uh, you actually you buy a box, you know, at uh, Target or Amazon or, you know, online, wherever you want to buy 
And um, the goal is to demystify chemistry. So it comes with these atoms uh, that can fit together with magnets and these little flexible arms and the pieces of metal. And then you take a picture of the molecule you made with your tablet and it'll do some bit, uh, image recognition on it and tell you what molecule you made if you did. And then the tablet also has curriculum that goes along with that and can take you through as you're learning about chemistry. Now, when you're thinking about your high level purpose, there are a couple things that I recommend you keep in mind. One, you want it to be brief. Uh, you want to be able to explain this to investors or funders, uh, your team. And so, you know, keep it succinct, keep it to the point. And keep it impact focused, right? What is the impact you want to have on your players that are playing your game or your experience? Not product focused. And of course, make it inspirational, right? Because at the end of the day, you'll be trying to, uh, maybe this is going into schools or maybe this is being used in the workplace. Uh, maybe you need to, again, get funders on board and, and inspire your team that's going to be working on this. Any, any people that you have outside of your office that are going to be working on it. The next thing that I want to talk about are some of the player transformations uh, that are important and that are uh, handled very well by VR virtual world experiences. And this is how you want your players to be different, right? So knowledge, of course, something that you know the player learns. They have, you know, they didn't know it before your experience, and now hopefully they know it afterwards. A skill. This is this is a wonderful use of virtual reality because it's so one to one. You're doing things with your actual hands, right? I can have an experience that teaches you how to juggle, uh, that teaches you how to do chemistry, and these skills that you learn in the virtual world, if it's done correctly, will persist afterwards. Maybe it's physical. There's a lot of VR games. You've probably played some of them that are uh, you know, very physically taxing, uh, can you know, be a workout or something like that. And then these next three are sort of related. VR is very good at putting you in uh, you know, these very immersive worlds where you can uh, experience different things from people's different points of view, you can have a different identity, and if it's done right, right, it'll have lasting effects that change your disposition toward things. And the last one uh, is, well, let's see, so barriers are, the last piece of the transformational framework, uh, barriers are there, and you know, w w if there were no barriers, people may already know what you're trying to teach them, right? So. What are the common barriers that virtual reality is so good at breaking down? Uh, difficulty. If it's you know, hard to do or understand, of course, in a virtual world, you have control of the world. You can meet out the information over time. Uh, same goes for complexity, right? You can uh, you know, teach players in a way that makes sense. You can bring in new information when you need to. And accessibility, right now, uh, the VR install base is, is rather small, but as the technology gets better and the price comes down and it becomes more available, of course, people will have access to this technology. And then, through the virtual worlds, you can give them access to other things that may not be available, right? I can experience what it's like to be on a space station. I can you know, go places that I'd never be able to travel otherwise and, and be in the shoes of uh, people that, you know, maybe uh, have some you know, problems or, or, or other difficulties that I don't have, and it's very accessible. Uh, you can teach people a lot through that. And then the last one is, you know, VR allows you to do things that are very scary or maybe very risky. Um, lighting things on fire, in a chemistry class, teaching people to make fireworks. Uh, you may not want to do that in, in the real world, but in, in VR it's okay, and, and you can learn things that persist outside of the game. And throughout the talk, I'll refer to these sometimes, and I have a little set of icons here so we can remember them, maybe. So that's just scratching the surface of the transformational framework. Uh, there's a lot more to talk about there, but I'm going to move on. And remember, the book's coming out soon. All right. So OK, so we, we, we've touched on transformative a bit and what that means to me and, and Shell Games. Uh, so let's talk about VR. I think it's the VR survey time. How many people have been in VR? Uh, I see I see most hands. Uh, how many people know very well the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality? All right, all right, this is good. Uh, three degrees of freedom versus six degrees of freedom? A little, little less? Okay, we'll spend a little time on that. Uh, so yeah, I'll probably cruise through a bunch of these slides uh, just for the sake of time because it seems like a lot of people know it. I will take the time now, though, to point out that these slides will be available on my website at the end of the day, and uh, that website will be linked at the end of the presentation. So yeah, virtual reality, you all know what that is. There's a bunch of headsets. That sounds pretty good. Uh, now there's also augmented reality. Augmented reality, uh, we're not talking about today. Sorry, sorry, augmented reality. I love you very much, and you're a huge growing market. 
Uh, but for today, we're going to focus on virtual reality. If you have questions about that, we can we can talk later. Uh, so degrees of freedom. Let's go over degrees of freedom because I had a little less hands that popped up. Uh, so three degrees of freedom is your basic flavor of VR. Uh, your phone has an accelerometer. You can put that in a headset, and now you're tracking your pitch and your yaw and your roll. And that's very exciting, and it's, you can see you know, everything around you. But if I'm holding something in front of me, when I move toward it, it moves with me. And uh, that's not very realistic. Uh, that's not very immersive, as it were, because that's not how the real world works. So for that, you need the next three degrees of freedom, which is, of course, positionally tracked. So now, when I move closer, I can actually get closer. I can look underneath. And that's a much more immersive experience that allows you to have the presence in the world that is so important to virtual reality and teaching with virtual reality. Uh, and then, of course, you want to control the world. Um, when you have a 3.3 system, the first three is for the head. The second three is for the hands. You got the dot in between to separate them. Google Daydream, it's like, think of it like a laser pointer, right? You're pointing it around and uh, Oculus Go and things like that. But of course, the Oculus Rift, the Vive, the PlayStation VR, Microsoft's headsets, they all have 6.6. .6. I mean, look how much happier she is when she's using, you know, she has fully tracked hands and head. She's super happy. That guy's just sort of like, ah, I'm in VR, you know? So that's where VR really shines is when you have 6.6. .6. That's what I feel, at least. Uh, tracking, of course, to get those extra three DOF, you gotta have something to know where the thing is in real life. Uh, the Vive, the Oculus, the PlayStation VR, they all are outside in. You have to set up something in your room. You probably all mostly know that. And, uh, and that's you know kind of a pain, right? And so now they have inside-out systems, which is great. The Microsoft Mixed Reality headsets all have that. And there are some new headsets that will be coming out that also make use of inside-out. I like to describe these as hard for the player to set up and easy for the player to set up. And so easy is always better. And of course, wired versus wireless. Look at this poor guy. He had to set up this whole contraption to keep his wire so he doesn't trip. When we're doing play tests, we always have to keep that in mind. Uh, and here I am in my Google Daydream. Yes, I only have three degrees of freedom, but I have no wires, so I'm pretty happy. You know, it's a, but, but what about the future, right? Where is this going? Right now, we have this major overlap between the three degrees of freedom and the wireless and the six degrees of freedom and the wired. Well, of course, where we would like to live is in the future, and the future is coming. So six degrees of freedom and wireless. Uh, with the HTC Vive, later this year, they're releasing their casting technology, which will allow you to uh, send both the image and the controls back and forth wirelessly. You'll still need to have a super powerful computer, though, to do that, and it'll probably cost a lot. Now, the Oculus Santa Cruz, how many people have heard of the Santa Cruz? Not many, okay. so. Uh, it's, uh, it's coming out uh, early next year, hopefully, and that's its code name, but it, it's going to be a game changer in my mind because it is 6.6 .6 self-contained. So like the Oculus Go is self-contained, the Santa Cruz will be as well. You'll just put it on, hold the controllers. It has four cameras to do the inside-out tracking. Everything's on board. You don't need a phone. You don't need a computer. You just put it on, and you're in good 6.6 .6 .6 VR. But, of course, the future is expensive or not here yet, uh, but it's coming very soon. So. So, hold on, it's coming. Now, how did we get to the future, though? Through the past. And of course, as all technology, it originally came from science fiction authors back in the 1930s, uh, and then it sort of had a very slow timeline. Up until, who, who remembers the 1995 classic film Hackers, uh, with the virtuality headset that the plague uses? That was actually the first virtual reality headset that I developed for. Uh, back in 2001, I developed for that. It has a 320 by 240 resolution, and 30 frames per second, if you're lucky. It, uh, but it did have magnetically tracked hands, so that was great. Uh, Disney did a lot of things with Disney Quest. But look at these last 10 years, of course. That's where we are right now. We're in the VR boom, right? These are all the consumer headsets that we know and love. But how did we get here? What allowed this to happen? It was the smartphone, right? As smartphones came out, they drove the quality of the CPUs and the quality of displays up and the prices down. And then, of course, people realized, hey, we can bring VR back and we can make it, you know, affordable for consumers. And that's a great thing in my mind. All right. All right. We're, we've got transformative. We've got VR. But what about getting started? We all want to get started in transformative VR, right? Uh, now, Shell Games, we have made a lot of games over the years. Uh, it would be too much to talk about all these games. Let's eliminate games that are not AR or VR or transformative. That did not get us very far. All right. Let's eliminate all games that are not AR or VR. All right, let's uh, eliminate all games that are uh, not transformative from there. All right, all right, we've got, a, we've got a very manageable number of games here. And of course, Happy Atoms, as I mentioned before, is an augmented reality title. We're not talking about you augmented reality, we're only talking about virtual reality, but I am gonna put back in I Expect You to Die. 
Because when we talk about getting started, that was really the first VR game that we made at Shell Games. And we learned a lot of lessons there that I would like to share with you today. So I'm going to show you. Uh, how many people have played I Expect You to Die or know about I Expect You to Die? All right, I'm going I'm to show a quick trailer. Good to see you, Agent. We're overdue for a quick evaluation of some of your more daring accomplishments. You've managed to thwart Dr. Zor's plans multiple times. Even after a few setbacks. Links corrupt. Deploying neurotoxin. Intruder detected. And a few more setbacks. However, you may still need to work on maintaining your composure in tight situations. Your professionalism leaves something to be desired. And maybe I put a little too much emphasis on love for danger in the job description. You've still become our most valuable agent, but I would be lying if I didn't tell you. I expect you to die. So uh, that is what we call a mixed reality trailer uh, because it shows the person and it shows the virtual world around them. Not to be confused, of course, with Microsoft's mixed reality headset, which is just really a virtual reality headset and they're just confusing things. Or when you talk about augmented reality, when you put things in a certain place and it stays there, some people call that mixed reality. VR is very confusing and uh, we still have to sort out some of the definitions of our terms. When we were creating I Expect You to Die, we had three pillars that we followed. Uh, and our tendency at Shell is to sort of make inspirational posters when you uh, create a game like this. And so the three for I Expect You to Die were layers of discovery, believe you are there, and lead them to cleverness. And really the layers of discovery and lead them to cleverness we're in the sort of escape the room and spy theme part of it. So what I want to talk about now is believe you are there. Because what that is getting to is the heart of why virtual reality is so good at teaching, at having, you know, making these transformations possible. Because what it's talking about is the sense of presence. When you have really good VR, you are fully immersed. You believe that you're in that place and you have a sense of presence there. And that allows you to learn by doing, right? These these, you know, the muscle memory, all, all, all these things apply when you have really good presence and your brain believes you're there. But of course, presence is a beautiful thing, but it's fragile, right? It's very fragile. And so you need to protect it at all costs. And I, I you know, in, in virtual reality, presence is sometimes greater than gameplay, right? Sometimes you need to make concessions on the gameplay side to preserve presence. And so what I'm going to talk about right now are five presence breakers and when you create your virtual reality experience you want to avoid these at all costs the first one is motion sickness of course uh, i'm actually very prone to vr motion sickness and uh, if someone is playing your game and they get motion sick and they take off the headset well you they're certainly not immersed anymore now with the higher frame rates and the lower latencies of the new technology you sort of get over that baseline, but then of course there is virtual movement and there are ways to do this. You could of course have the player just sit down like we do in I Expect You to Die uh, and give them some ability to bring things closer perhaps. Uh, a lot of games you've probably play, played have a teleportation mechanic and that can be very useful. It can also break presence a little, although honestly you'd be amazed how much people sort of just get used to that and they don't even remember that that's how they were moving afterwards. It's kind of amazing. And then one that Shell Games has been working with recently is a vignetting. Uh, you also see Eagle Flight, some games like that. Basically, when you move forward, you sort of fade out the pixels on the periphery because our brains get a lot of the motion sense from the pixel on the periphery. So if you can make those pixels not be moving, uh, it helps a lot with the motion sickness. Proprioceptive disconnect. Good luck translating that. So proprioception is the idea of knowing your body knows where the pieces of it are at any one time, right? So if you're creating a virtual reality experience where you're standing up, it's a good idea to have them uh, standing up in the real world so that matches. Uh, again, in, in I Expect You to Die, in some games we are sitting down, and it just helps to make sure that those match. I, I played the game Lone Echo, 
and uh, its movement system actually made me fall over. So I had to play the game sitting, but it was always a little confusing to me that I was sitting when my robot character was sort of floating around the space station. Of course, there are a lot of different controls to all the VR headsets, and you really want to avoid control confusion because when you're in a headset, you can't see your hands. If you don't know how to pick something up, well, that's going to break your immersion and your presence. Uh, I expect you to die when it was originally created, used a mouse uh, for the Oculus Share. This was before any touch controllers or hand controllers of any kind had come out. And it was actually a very intuitive system, and we found we didn't even need much of a training or a tutorial. And then when we moved to hands, obviously uh, picking things up became very intuitive and easy and using things. But for the telekinetic ability that allows you to bring faraway things close that we had in the game, we actually had to develop a, a whole room and a, and a sequence of sort of this, this training mission before you go on the real missions. So players would have time to get used to these controls and figure them out before we put them in the sort of the high pressure situation. When I talk about shallow object interactions, it's very important in VR that people can do what they would like to do. So for instance, in one of the puzzles, uh, we have some screws and we have a knife that you can cut things with. But a lot of people would try to use the knife as a screwdriver. And that's a very clever thing. We would love to support that, but sort of for uh, pieces of the meta puzzle and other reasons, we just couldn't allow that. But we still saw people doing it and we wanted to acknowledge it. Feedback can go a long way to, pres to preserving presence if you give it to them. And so we actually have a little bit of audio that plays that says, I've seen you do many clever things with a knife, but I'm afraid turning screws won't be one of them. And so what that does is it acknowledges that they tried to do it and it gives them the freedom to move on and find another solution. Now, we also have a lot of fire in I Expect You to Die. Uh, you know, once you give someone a lighter, they're going to want to light a lot of things on fire. And if that's core to your game mechanics or, or you know, really important, that's great. But you have to support uh, doing all these crazy things. And I expect you to die. You can light a paper airplane on fire, throw it across the room, and it lights a bunch of books on fire. We sort of went really deep on the interactions of fire. Now, if you don't have the scope or if it's not necessary, maybe you just don't put the lighter in the game, right? If you find that someone is doing something with an item that you can't support fully, you might want to take that item out of your virtual reality experience. And that's when the presence is greater than gameplay uh, axiom comes up again. The last one I want to talk about is unrealistic audio because when you are in VR, I, I'm not going to, well, maybe I'll drop something. No, I'm not going to drop anything. Usually I drop a bottle of water during this because when you drop a bottle of water in real life, you hear that water hit the ground and it, it makes a different sound whether you drop it on a glass table versus a metal table versus a hard surface. And I expect you to die. We have hard surfaces, soft surfaces, metal, and glass. We take into account how hard an object hits something else, and we sort of mix all these sounds from the different surfaces together to provide an audio experience that is very immersive and can give you that presence. We found that it takes roughly double the audio budget of a traditional screen space game to get the audio to where it wants to be in virtual reality. So here's a quick summary slide there. So yeah, avoid these things. And when you do, you can create this sense of presence. And a wonderful thing happens. Uh, this playtester was so scared of the laser that was going to shoot her, she put her hands up to block it, right? She reached her hand up to touch the car ceiling and see what it was made of. And notice she has no controllers. This was the mouse version of the game. We had a fully immersive experience with mouse controllers that she believed she was there, right? And that's when you really have people's attention and you can either give them a very entertaining experience or you can teach them something. Uh, here I'm calling out the fuzzy rug, which is underneath our play tester. And when someone is fully immersed and at the end they take their controllers off and they put them on the table that doesn't exist in the real world, those controllers fall to the ground and break. So you want to put a fuzzy rug there to protect them. But it does another thing. It protects your guest. When you're in VR, you really want to protect the guest because it's probably new to them. And if you're really immersed in the world and you lean on a table or something that doesn't exist, you fall to the ground as well. So the fuzzy rug helps them as well. You always want to take care of your guest. So I'm going to talk about a couple projects from Shell Games. Uh, the first is Water Bears VR. And its high level purpose is, again, to provide hands-on experience with systems thinking concepts. And I'll show you a trailer so that makes a little more sense.
trailer. It's just so cute. I had to show the whole trailer. Um, and it is relevant. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, the barriers that Water Bears VR was uh, seeking to break down is sort of the difficulty and complexity of learning these uh, very layered systems, right? So we were able to bring them in over time, over a course of a bunch of levels, over a course of different level packs, and allow the players to sort of explore these and, and, and master one before they move on to the other. And in fact, we did a thing where there's sort of the base puzzles, and then they can move on to the next section, or there are advanced puzzles if they want to go deeper. So they control uh, how they're learning and the play flow, that's very important as well. So someone I want to talk about is Barbara Oakley. I actually saw her speak a couple weeks ago and she has a book coming out called Learning How to Learn. And one of the things that she talks about in that book is two different modes of the brain. There is the focused mode of the brain. And if you think of the brain maybe as a pinball machine, uh, you can have a thought that is bouncing around between the bumpers of your brain. And when you're in focus mode, you're very focused on something and you're concentrating on it and you're really trying to memorize it or learn it very well. And so your thoughts are very uh, localized in, you know, uh, on that. But then, of course, there's another part of your brain, which is the diffuse mode. And the diffuse mode is very important to learning because if you're very focused on something, you're not going to get to that other part of your brain. You're not going to make some of the connections that are so important to learning. And so having a mix of these two modes when you're learning is very important. And of course, game designers have been doing this for years. We have tense and release, right? We have a part of the game where it's very tough to get over that platform, or you've got to solve that puzzle, where there's a timed part, right? And it's very you're very focused on that. But then what do we do? We give you a reward, right? We give you uh, something to play with, a new, a new tool or a new weapon, or uh, time to explore or something like that, right? So we have this tense and release that very much mirrors the sort of focus mode and diffuse mode that the brain is in when it's learning. And so this is a very good thing to keep in mind when you're creating a transformative game to make sure that you support both of these. At the end of a water bears level, the water bears are swimming around you. There are fireworks going off. You can tickle the little guys. Oh, it's a great time. It's a great time. Hollow Lab Champions is a title that is actually coming out uh, next month, very soon. And its uh, strategy is virtual lab practice, real lab mastery. And we worked uh, with a grant uh, to make this. And it's sort of a chemistry game show. So you are a contestant on this chemistry game show. And you have to do things like make fireworks and make fluorescing liquids. And we sort of ramp it up over time uh, and to teach you these things. So I'll show you what that looks like real quick. Welcome to the greatest event in the galaxy. The traditional chemistry lab finally has a modern companion. Developed with input from chemistry teachers, Hollow Lab Champions is an immersive, safe, and best of all, entertaining environment that makes mastering lab skills fun. As game show contestants, players can perform a variety of lab challenges, leading to a show-stopping final lab. Or, in practice mode, they can hone their skills on a specific task. Players are scored on accuracy and safety as they perform work that prepares them for success in a real lab. Hall Lab Champions is the chemistry lab companion you've been waiting for. So some of the barriers that that breaks down uh, in VR to uh, enable the learning goals. Again, difficulty and complexity, we can meet these tasks out over time. Uh, we can give you sort of the reward moments as you go. And also fear, right? Uh, working with chemicals that are toxic or uh, lighting things on fire and having them explode. Even just glass beakers, right? We do support that depth of interaction, right? You can enter here, you can pick up a glass breaker, beaker and break it on the ground. Most play testers do, quite frankly. Uh, and that's great, right? Because they expect that to work. It works, it makes a sound, it keeps them in the world. We actually penalize them points-wise, uh, because you're, that's not safe lab practice to throw beakers on the ground. Uh, but we allow you to do it, right? Because if we didn't, if we just said, er, no, you can't throw it, that would break your presence. That would not uh, you know, go toward the immersiveness of the world. So. These, this is great, right? Transformative VR, it's super awesome. It's, it's I, you know, I, I feel very optimistic it's gonna help change the world for the better. So there's gotta be a catch. And of course there are cons to VR and AR education. Uh, the first one, of course, this is very new technology. 
the adoption of it is not very large. It's constantly changing. So you develop for one platform, and then a year later, there's a new platform that's already come out, right? Uh, it's, it's accelerating very quickly. People aren't sure, should they invest in this not, right? We haven't had the tipping point of that. And of course, it's harder to develop for. We've, we've talked about some of the difficulties, you know, uh, audio, budget, double, just in general, there are uh, things that you need to keep in mind, but you can, you can keep them in mind. They're considerations. Don't think of them as cons. Think of them as considerations. I'm not sure if that translates to Portuguese, but perhaps it does. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, with new technology, right, embrace it. It's, it's, it's very exciting that in the future, there will be standalone 6.6 .6 degree of freedom virtual reality, right? Because when that arrives, you are able to give this experience to people very easily. And that's going to be awesome. And you can develop now uh, for the Rift using engines like Unity and Unreal, and they'll automatically support it. Uh, and, and so hopefully, you know, you can make the transition. And, and of course, the technology is always getting better and the price is always coming down, so that's great. Now, with the harder development, there's, there are some tricks you can do for that. You know, of course, you want to plan for it. Uh, yes, it definitely will be a bigger budget, larger scope, that sort of thing, longer timelines. Uh, you really, really want to embrace rapid iteration. Uh, game development in general, of course, wants to do that. But in VR, it's more important than ever because you're not sure how people are going to react, right? We, we, we understand mobile games now. We understand PC and console games very well. But how people act in VR is still new because it's new to them. And so uh, I actually gave a talk that covers a lot of these things uh, at GDC and VRDC this past spring. That talk is free on the internet and it's linked to from my website. So if you'd like to learn way more about this stuff that I'm about to cover briefly, you can go and watch that talk. Uh, at my website, seanpatton.com, it's also linked at the end. And uh, yeah, you'll find out what Brian Baxing spot cameras and fuzzy rugs. We did talk about fuzzy rugs a little bit, uh, but there's more to that. And of course, brown boxing. What is brown boxing? Let's take a look. And then, ding, ding, ding. This goes green, fire is flooded, it's now green. Hooray! Uh, engine. Engine. It's over here. Temperature is the number. Is, uh, that's a cold cord and that's a grenade. Like this is a grenade. Yep. This is here. Alright, you're holding in your hand. The pin is missing. So, what was that? This was, we created uh, a few of the levels of I Expect You to Die out of cardboard. That's why we call it brown boxing. Of course, in normal game dev, we have white boxing untextured models, uh, very quickly put together so you can get a feel for things. In VR, this doesn't require any tech or any art. You know, in a couple days, you can have a, you know, life size, right, because everything's one-to-one. -one. Uh, you know, you can see where things should be. What can people reach? What do people notice? What don't they notice? You can do all this testing very, very, very quickly, and it's great. We always do brown boxing now, and for the levels that we did for I Expect You to Die that we brown boxed first, it cut our development time for those levels by 25%, which is huge, right? And then, of course, you need to uh, play test these virtual worlds that you've created. And I have found over the years that there are four magical questions that are useful in any VR experience, uh, probably any screen space experience too, but I highly recommend them. The first one is, what was the most frustrating moment or interaction? Now, you ask that first because you want it to be fresh in their mind. Because if something is too frustrating, they're, not even, they're going to take the headset off. They're not even going to see the rest of your experience. So you want to understand what that is and fix it and track it over time. Of course, you want the opposite feel good. What was the best moment or interaction? Because you want to make sure that you put more of stuff like that in your game or experience. The third one very much has to do with that feeling of presence and preserving it. Was there anything you wanted to do that you couldn't, right? If someone's trying to do something and they can't, that's gonna chip away at the presence and you want to make sure you can either support it or maybe remove that tempting object. And the last one is if you had a magic wand to wave and you could change, add, or remove anything from the experience, what would it be? Now this, having the, the mental image of having a magic wand in the hand, there's very something very concrete about that. It helps play testers focus and, and give you good feedback. And I find that if you track these over time, you can see uh, how things are changing. Now I abbreviate these, frustrating, favorite, wanted, and wand. 
Of course, this will change in Portuguese, but I call it fua. Uh, so it's you know easy to remember, right? Um, now these are four questions, but of course, for your experience, all experiences are, in games are different. You may want to add you know a few more. So for instance, for I expect you to die, we added the fifth question: When did you feel most clever? Uh, that was very important to us that players would feel clever when they're playing the game. So we always made sure to ask them that, making the acronym fua, which is a little worse. Um, but and you know, for your experience, add questions. Don't add too many, though, because again, the key to this is to track them over time. This is just a small snippet of the over 100 playtests that we conducted on I Expect You to Die throughout its development. Um, and you know, we track these things over time. And if the you know the frustrating items sort of drop off and they're replaced by new ones, that's good. You're going in the right direction, right? If there's something that they love and then it starts to disappear, and you're like, oh, people used to love this. Did we break it? Did we make it worse? Right? And so you can track these over time, and it helps you focus in on what's important to making your game or experience great. All right, we've, uh, we've got transformative, we've got VR, and now we've, we've gotten started in it. Is the talk over? No, I've still got more time. The talk continues. Because we're, we want to talk about the future, right? What is the future of transformative VR? And I'm going to show a few videos that I have edited uh, from different projects from around the world. Uh, and, and again, these sort of tie back into the transformational framework because again, when you think about the high level purpose, not only now are we juggling while riding a unicycle, VR is hard. We know that VR is hard. So we've, we've added fire. We now have fiery clubs that we're juggling on our unicycle. This is a very hard thing. So you want to make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons. So that's where the high level purpose becomes so important. Tell me. Do you like game? <laughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Tell me, do you like games? Well, welcome to my game. Me, Colonel Sanders. And I'm watching your every move. This game will teach you how to make my original recipe chicken. The hard way. Chicken right, you will not be allowed to leave. Trainee, you sure are good at inspecting chicken. Proper technique. All right, uh, put your, your supple human hands in that bread and uh, give that chicken a toss. Why don't you take it for a spin? Exciting. So what was the high level of transformation goal of that, right? Well, it's training for Kentucky Fried Chicken Cooks. This is actually a real thing. Uh, I have contacted developers. I've had email correspondence with them. This is available to uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken training centers to augment the traditional training that the cooks receive. And man, that's way more interesting than the back kitchen of a KFC. And I know you guys have KFCs because I looked on Google Maps, right? You your KFCs in San Paulo. So, I mean, that, that's incredible to me, right? Like, look at this craziness that's going on right now. So that, that was, uh, again, I've edited these videos. They're not this choppy in the, in the real things, but uh, that is a uh, training for hazardous chemical truck drivers uh, that, that Deloitte Digital uh, in the US has worked on. And I mean, it, it's amazing. I mean, if, if 
I'm a game designer and I, I look at that truck and I'm like, that is a terribly designed puzzle. Like, that's way too complicated for anyone. But that's what the trucks actually look like that carry these hazardous chemicals. So no wonder they need help training. And they've released this as a pilot program and they've found it cuts their training time by two thirds. It takes one third the time to do the training that it used to do because of things like this, right? Uh, you know, maybe not as quite as interesting as the Kentucky Fried Chicken one, but. And then of course, uh, just being here at BIG this week, right? I've learned so much about the, the VR projects that you guys are all making. Uh, Immersys is doing great work. Uh, yesterday was a talk, they were talking about the, the vaccine VR where they help kids, uh, you know, be more calm and, and patient while they're getting vaccines by putting them in a virtual world with a gear VR, right? I mean, these are amazing things uh, right here in Brazil. And he here's another group that's doing it. Quando o assunto é EdTech, Education Technology, nós fazemos acontecer. Mercado corporativo ou mercado acadêmico, sempre haverá um jeito DOT de fazer EdTech. Com os profissionais mais capacitados, com as tecnologias mais avançadas, com as soluções mais focadas. Não é apenas uma evolução na maneira de fazer educação à distância. É uma revolução. Soluções relevantes exigem muito, e nós temos muito a oferecer. Simuladores e sistemas interativos como realidade virtual e aumentada. And so the DOT group, they're uh, a little further south here in Brazil, but, uh, you know, they're doing educational training for, for basically whatever, uh, and, and, and they're finding this to be uh, accepted and very, uh, you know, uh, well received by the people that they do these projects for. And I mean, this is great, right? This is the future of transformative VR. But wait a minute, I just showed you trailers for all of these things, right? So this isn't the future, this is the present of transformative VR. And as we work together at uh, conferences like this, as we share information, as we create these truly immersive worlds that people can be present in, that they can learn by doing, they can pick up these skill sets. We can break down the barriers to learning that are there. VR can do this and VR will continue to do this. And we're all gonna work on it together. We're all gonna make the world a better place through these experiences and games that we make. We're gonna do this together after the World Cup is over because we can watch that in VR as well. Uh, thank you, obrigado. Okay. I have one question. Uh, I'll read it to you. Thank you. Do you believe that a world in a virtual game in the future could take it the proportion to become a second life? As an example, the game Second Life, but in VR, up to a point where people start to live two lives, a real one and a virtual one. Uh, that's a very interesting question, right? I mean, uh, you think about the, you know, the movie Ready Player One came out recently. There's been movies in the past that have uh, touched on virtual reality and, you know, uh, will people live their entire lives in virtual reality? It doesn't seem like a good thing to me. Uh, will that happen? Uh, Second Life, things like that are out now. I mean, I think that virtual reality, augmented reality, they are new platforms that are here. Uh, just like mobile was a new platform, uh, it didn't get rid of console or uh, you know PC gaming. And virtual reality, yes, it is amazing, right? When you're in good virtual reality, you have 6.6 .6 tracking. It is an, an amazing experience. Uh, could I see a world where people spend a lot of time in there? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I do also see a world where it connects people around the world. Uh, one of the first VR chat rooms that I went in, I was sitting at a virtual campfire I was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the US. I was with someone from Norway, someone in a university in Austria, and someone in Italy. And we got to know each other around this virtual campfire. So I think that, you know, as humans, just like we need to, you know, have moderate amounts of time with our mobile phones, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna be important to have moderate amounts of time in our view worlds. But I think the potential uh, far uh, goes beyond any of the maybe limitations or the risks involved in that. Uh, we don't have any more questions, I think. Thank you. I appreciate it. O nosso convidado, vamos aplaudir, Sean Payton, da Shell Games. Thank you very much.